from Christian backgrounds and they've made a decision to follow Jesus. Do you pray immediately? Do you wait for something to manifest and show that they have a, a need for deliverance? How do you go about that? I'm going to be talking about that today, as well as answering the question, how does a church build relationship with a community if they don't really have that established? Maybe you are a disciple maker and you want to see your church build a stronger relationship in the community that surrounds the church. So I'm going to talk about that. If you have a question about how to make and multiply disciples or you're stuck on a discipleship issue, disciple making issue, I'm here to answer those questions. My name is Cynthia Anderson. I am a disciple making movements trainer and coach. And I've been involved in discipleship and disciple making mostly in Asia, but also in Africa and now globally around the world, coaching people to start disciple making movements for the last 30 years. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I have probably faced the issue that you are facing. And so I'm excited to be here with you today to answer these questions and talk about these questions that people have sent in to me ahead of time. I would love to greet you and know where you're coming in from. So pop into the chat where you're joining from. Those of you on Instagram, those of you who are on YouTube or on Facebook or wherever you're joining in from, I'd love to know where you, where you are. And again, if you have a question that you would like me to address, go ahead and add that there to the chat. So let's start in with this first question, which came in from a worker who has been working in a country in Asia that is mostly made up of Buddhist people. And several of these Buddhist young people have come to the Lord. They've received Jesus. Um, but there's been some issues with deliverance and a need for deliverance. And they've prayed for some and then uh, had issues where recurring um oppression or different kind of demonic activities been taking place. So this question came up in a coaching call and I thought it's a wonderful thing for us to talk about today. So when do you pray for deliverance? Well, there's two options really, and I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer to this. Um, I think it's more both and and right or wrong, but you can either Pray for deliverance um, preventatively, in a sense, assuming that if they are someone who's grown up in a Buddhist, Hindu, or Muslim background, that there have been demonic attachments from idol worship or from the wearing of amulets or things like that. You can assume that there probably is some demonic influence that has attached itself in this person's life. And you can be preventative and just go ahead and take action to pray those things off of them and pray a cleansing prayer and pray deliverance over them as a routine kind of thing you do when people come to Christ. Um, or you can wait for some form of manifestation to happen and then address it at that point. So, but most likely, um, and this is one thing that I just wanted to communicate and kind of normalize for you. Most likely, if people have been involved in uh, anything to do with, with New Age, anything to do with Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam, um, and even for many who are in the West, I see um, some from the West. I see Dana and Jim there. Good to see you guys. Others, um, even for people in the West, um, with the increasing um, involvement with, with yoga as exercise, some yoga teachers, maybe not all, but some instructors would be bringing in things that have Hindu overtones. And um, so... I would say more and more deliverance needs to be normalized. It doesn't have to be a big, huge knockdown, shake out fight with a demon, you know, where we shout and yell and a bunch of people come around them and pray really loud prayers in tongues for hours and hours. It doesn't have to be like that, right? It can be kind of um, gentle, but more and more, I am under the opinion that we need to take proactive, you know, proactive measures with people we are discipling to pray cleansing prayers over them and encourage them to go through a process of renouncing anything that they may have done that has invited uh, the attachment or the involvement of demonic spirits or demonic strongholds into their life. 
and just preventatively making this quite, you know, simple and uh, not a big deal, but something that becomes quite normative. And, you know, we find in the New Testament, and I just wanted to, to read um, a couple of passages to remind us, you know, in the New Testament, it was, it was kind of normal, right? It was normative. Um, Jesus sent his disciples out. He told them, what do you do? Go. In Luke chapter 9 and 10, he said, go, heal the sick, cast out demons, proclaim the kingdom of God is here right? So it, it was normative for a disciple of Jesus to walk in the authority they have to deal with demonic spirits, right? But for many of us today, it's become specialized. It's become something that people who are really, you know, expert exorcists, you know, or <laughs> they're super spiritual. They're the people we call when we have to deal with a demonic issue. Um, I think that that needs to change, right? And we need to empower and equip every believer to walk in the authority that Jesus has given us to um, take authority over demonic spirits and demonic strongholds that are around them. Um, and especially if you're working with Buddhist, um, Muslims or Hindu background um, people who are coming to faith, uh, even more so, I would say, in that context. So let me read a scripture. And this is Luke chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Right? So Jesus, when he sent those first 12 out and he, you know, he had modeled for them, he had cast out demons in front of them, and now he's sending them out. And he says, go and go in my power, go in my authority uh, to do this work of di driving out demons and curing diseases, healing the sick. It is the, uh, the commission and the authority that I think not only those 12, but each one of us, as it's been handed down to us, this authority to set people free. And um, again, let's try to find ways that we can normalize this rather than it being a specialized ministry um, of deliverance. Uh, we don't actually find it as a spiritual gift. We find the gift of discernment in scripture, but we don't find the gift of deliverance as a spiritual gift. Why? Because it's a gift and an authority that every believer who uh, has the power of the Holy Spirit in them can walk in. So how do you go about setting someone free? Um, whether it be when, when there's a demon manifesting itself in an overt way, maybe the person falls on the floor, begins to shake or foam at the mouth. And I've certainly dealt with all of those situations um, before. Or you are noticing something in their life where you just, they just can't seem to get breakthrough. Um, there's often a demon, demon that's involved in that. And you want to take authority over that and help them get to a place of freedom. So how do you do that? How do you go about that? Um, I want to simplify again um, and just say that use the name of Jesus. Pray with authority. Um, I like uh, my preference and perhaps partly my personality is to go with a really low key kind of approach. Um, you don't want to make it some big, hairy, scary thing that they're, you know, they're really worried about or make a big deal out of it. But just say, you know, uh, a lot of times when people are coming from a background like yours, um, a lot of people who I know have needed to pray to ask Jesus to set them free and have needed someone to also pray over them for freedom and cleansing from demonic spirits that have um, attached themselves in their life. Um, let me just uh, pause here a moment and talk about the difference between attachment and possession. Okay, so this is something that when, you know, I went through Bible school and I learned like a good evangelical Christian that Christians could not be filled with the Holy Spirit and also be demon possessed, right? So if you were a Christian and you had prayed to receive Jesus, then uh, the possibility of demonic possession was not there, right? That was the theolog theological framework that 
I learned in Bible college and, and came into things. And maybe some of you are in that position. Um, but in reality, <laughs> when we went to Nepal and we started interacting with people who were coming out of Tibetan Buddhist backgrounds, coming out of Hindu backgrounds, we found that even after people had prayed the sinner's prayer, there very often were, was demonic involvement in their life. And I just had to let go of needing to put it in a box, right? And call it possession or call it oppression, right? And I had to let go of that theological box and say, okay, this is the reality of what we're facing in trying to serve and help this person be discipled into greater authority and walking in freedom. And so whether we call it oppression or whether we call it possession, certainly if a person is manifesting, you know, classically we would call that possession. But what if they've already prayed a sinner's prayer? You know, then we get all confused in our head. Forget about worrying about the theological box and just help the person get free. Okay. Are you, are you with me? What do you guys think? Give me some feedback on that. But that's what we needed to do. We just needed to help the person get free. And how did we do that? We did that by simply laying our hands on them and praying in the name of Jesus and commanding the evil spirit to go in Jesus name. Um, first of all, you need to understand and know and be confident of the authority you do have in Jesus' name. And I've told a lot of people it's easier to cast out a demon from, you know, in my experience than it is to see someone healed, right? And now some, some healings do involve demonic things as well. But not every sickness is caused by a demon, right? <laughs> but when there's a clearly manifesting demon, cast it out in Jesus name. Jesus has given you authority to do that. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a big scary thing. It's just using the name of Jesus and saying, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave this person. In the name of Jesus, I command you to go. Um, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus and we command that you leave, right? So when there's a, an overt manifestation, Take authority in the name of Jesus. Pray that prayer. Now, Jesus did say that there are some demonic oppressions and possession, you know, demo demonic influences that only come out through prayer and fasting. So if you are praying a prayer of deliverance over them, there's a couple other things that I would do. One is I would, I would spend some time in fasting prayer and continue to pray prayers of deliverance over them. The next thing I would do is I would ask them some questions, um, ask them about unforgiveness issues, ask them about bitterness issues in their life. Oftentimes people get stuck and they, um, they've actually allowed an inroad for a demonic stronghold in their life because of unforgiveness and bitterness that they've held on to. So as you minister to them in that area of unforgiveness and help them to obey Jesus by releasing forgiveness, as they release forgiveness, pray cleansing prayers over them. And so we just pray in the name of Jesus that this, uh, this stronghold will be broken over their life, that they would be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and every demonic influence would go in the name of Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? It just can be simple, calm prayers that are prayed to help them become free. Uh, but freedom is ours in Jesus name, right? And so you should see a change in them. If you continue to see that manifestation uh, there, I would just continue to ask God for discernment as to what kinds of questions you might want to ask. There may be things that they've done in their past that they need to repent of and renounce. Maybe it was uh, something that they they did some kind of idol worship that they need to renounce that and say, I repent for my idolatry. I repent for bowing down. I repent for engaging and worshiping that. And I ask you to forgive me, Lord Jesus. And when they've prayed that prayer, then you come and you just pray that cleansing prayer over them. So we cast off every demon and every demonic stronghold from this person in Jesus' mighty name and um, be cleansed, be made whole, be set free. So we, again, just simple prayers of faith um, that address those kinds of issues. Um, 
Another thing I wanted to mention as I talk about this, and again, give me some feedback. Tell me what you're thinking. If you have follow-up questions about this, feel free to ask those. Uh, but another thing that we've found is um, sometimes people unknowingly, without realizing that certain things they've done or are doing have demonic attachments or demonic um, connections, maybe things like in the West, maybe playing uh, with a Ouija board or, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. Some of those kinds of things can at times have demonic connections for them. So ask them to just invite the Holy Spirit to shine his light on, is there anything? Ask, just tell them, ask the Holy Spirit to show you if there's anything that you've done that may have given a, um, an inroad or an opening for demonic um, attachment or engagement um, that, that the Holy Spirit's going to show you that you need to repent of. So um, the Holy Spirit will show them and the Holy Spirit will show you as you pray those kinds of prayers. So, um, and at times, you know, I've uh, in a context where you have people from Hindu background, you may Muslim background, they may have an amulet, they may have something that they have put trust in and faith in for their protection. So uh, you may need to talk to them about that. And, you know, putting their protection and their trust for protection in Jesus, and in his lordship over their life, his covering over their life, instead of putting their confidence in that charm or in that amulet or a uh, thing and they may need to you know repent of putting their trust in that instead of in their their creator jesus who loves them and they may need to remove that um you know that's where we see in scripture that people remove their amulets they remove their idols sometimes they burned those things uh, in india we've sometimes taken them to the river and put them in the river um as a sign of just releasing those and releasing our trust and our hope in those things to protect and to shield or to help us in a way that God is supposed to help us, right? Instead of looking to those items or those things for protection. Okay, so uh, again, let me know what you're thinking. I see a few comments there. Um, I see some amens. Yeah, great. Amos watching from. Paul, we've got Walter. Walter, where are you joining in? From? Um, and we've got some others here from Kenya. Dolly, good to have you here. Oh, Walter from Liberia. Great. Must be late there. Um, so those are some, uh, feel free to let me know if there's additional questions you have. But one other question that I wanted to be sure to talk about is after you prayed for someone, and they've received deliverance. Uh, sometimes you'll see a physical change. Sometimes when someone is being set free, they will vomit, actually. Uh, that's fairly common. Don't be shocked by that. Um, but there may be no physical change that you observe. That doesn't mean they're not set free. OK, if you've prayed in faith, you can believe that they are free. Right. And um, trust with them and thank God for that until you have evidence otherwise. Right. So after they've been set free, what do you do next? And um, these are some things that some tips that I'd like to give related to that. Um, after deliverance. There's four things that I want to encourage you to consider doing with someone. And the first one is to address the lordship and obedience issue. So if someone has manifested something demonic or they've been struggling with a stronghold of the mind and you've been ministering to them deliverance and they've received freedom, the next thing you want to do is encourage them to put their full heart and soul trust in Jesus and choose to become not just a believer, but a disciple who follows his ways in everything they do. So encourage them to take that step of obedience. If they have not yet been baptized, the first thing I would do is encourage them to take the step of water baptism, to obey Jesus by being baptized and making a public confession of their faith and trust in him. Right. So number one is obedience and lordship, including baptism. Number two is I would pray for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? We find that passage in Matthew 12, 
44 to 46. And let me just uh, read that in the Message Bible. It says, when a defiling evil spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis, some unsuspecting soul. It can be devil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On returning, it finds the person spotlessly clean but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. That person ends up far worse off than if they'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place, right? So that passage in Matthew 12 is one that we need to remember as we're ministering deliverance to people is we need to get them filled up with Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. So I would then pray for the Holy Spirit to fill them um, as they take baptism, that's a great time to pray for just a powerful infilling of the Holy Spirit um, to come into their lives and in faith that they would receive that as well. The third thing I would say is teach them how to rebuke a demon or demonic presence if it returns, right? Um, there was a lady we were praying, Bengali lady we were praying for in India. She was gloriously set free. That very next night, she had a demonic dream. This this demon, this idol, you know, this uh, Hindu goddess came to her. Uh, Kali is the name of the goddess, goddess of death and destruction. Came to her in a dream, threatened her, and said, "If you don't return to worshiping me, I'm going to kill your family." So she had this terrible demonic dream, and we had to teach her: when you have a dream like that, this is what you do. You pray in the name of Jesus and you take authority over that. Just speak to it in the name of Jesus. You have to go. I am a child of the King of Kings and Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And in his name, I command you to leave. Okay, so you want to train them and teach them to command that demon to leave right? And um, equip them so they don't have to call you every time they have some sort of uh, encounter, which is fairly common, you know, with a demon that will try to reclaim its territory in the person's life. So yeah, I see a question here on Instagram. Does a person that has repented also need to renounce it? Um, in my mind, uh, that's coming from, from Dana. In my mind, repentance and re renunciation are pretty similar. Um, you know, so yeah, I would say if they've repented, just include in repentance, you know, I'm, I ask forgiveness and I, I cut off every tie with this thing. So I guess, I guess my answer would be include it and combine those two together. But um, repentance, repentance is definitely the starting point. But if you find that they're still not experiencing freedom, go ahead and pray those renunciation prayers of cutting off ties, um, canceling every tie that might be there in Jesus' name, um, praying the blood of Jesus over that area of their life. And uh, yeah, continue to kind of press in. So renunciation is definitely an additional step, you know, that you could take with them, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's always necessary, you know, it's always needful. Uh, sometimes that prayer of repentance is, you know, it, it's enough. And um, so, yeah, there's no like textbook answers on some of these things. And yet there are some principles that we do find in scripture. So one last thing that I want to mention in what you do after deliverance, uh, the fourth thing is you want to pray cleansing prayers, right? So pray cleansing prayers over them and over yourself. When you engage in a deliverance kind of ministry with someone, um, at times that demonic spirit will try to attach itself to you as the person. Now, this is not something you need to be fearful of, my friends. Uh, please don't take it that way, but it is wise to cleanse yourself spiritually after you've ministered to someone in the area of deliverance. So I don't do that usually in front of the person, but if I've ministered deliverance when I go home, I then say, now, Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you've done in so-and-so's life. I pray that you would also now cleanse me from every 
every possible attachment, every involvement that could be there. I pray that I would just be cleansed by your blood, that you would wash over me, Holy Spirit, and make me pure and holy. And any attachment between me and that person or me and those demonic spirits would just be cut off in your precious name. And I thank you for doing this for me in Jesus' name. So when you pray those cleansing prayers, it provides protection for you as the person ministering to them from any kind of demonic influence that could have inadvertently sort of come over onto you from them. Um, I do have a blog that I where I have a copy of that prayer. And so I'm going to put that in the chat for you and you guys can take a look at that um, on my blog. Or you can go to dmmsfrontiermissions.com slash blog type in deliverance and you'll get some of these things that I've been talking about plus that cleansing prayer there as well. So that's for you as a person praying for them. Um, you also want to encourage them to cleanse their life and cleanse their home from anything that has demonic attachments to it. Um, so for example, uh, if they, let's say they come from a Buddhist background, they're maybe they're a young person, 20 years old, they're still living at home. Um, their parents are worshiping the statue of Buddha every, every day. They're worshiping the ancestors. Um, what I encourage people to do is cleanse what you have authority over, right? You have authority over your own body. You don't need to wear amulets, right? You have, you don't have to, uh, you know, remove all the amulets from your mother's, you know, room or her neck if she's not yet received Christ, right? So take authority over what you have authority over and, and cleanse yourself from anything that could have demonic attachment to it. Um, whenever we would move into a new house, like when we're here in Thailand, we move into a new, new location or we're renting a house, we go room by room and we just pray cleansing prayers. Lord Jesus, we don't know what's happened here in this room, but we know that your spirit is now here and we pray the blood of Jesus will cover everything. We pray you'll wash this place and make it a temple for your Holy Spirit to dwell as you dwell in us, dwell in our home. And we go room by room and we just pray cleansing prayers. Every demon that had any authority in this place be gone in the name of Jesus. And I know that sounds kind of funny or maybe even for some of you weird or superstitious, but I've seen that demons attach to people and they attach to places, right? And so it doesn't hurt to go the extra mile you know, and again, you don't have to make this big shouting match, but just go room by room. Or if you are, you know, a, a new believer and you're in, you only have one little bed that's yours, but in that place, just pray cleansing prayers that this would be a place where the Holy Spirit would dwell and every demonic power would have to leave in Jesus' name. So yes, cleansing your home is really important. And uh, when we haven't done that, or when I've had friends who haven't done that, living in a place where there's lots of demonic activity, idolatry, idol worship, ancestral worship, often we find that there will be some sort of kind of low grade, suddenly you find yourself angry a lot, or suddenly you find yourself really having marital conflict that wasn't there before. Um, or, you know, your children start having bad dreams or there might be sickness or something like that. So we've always found that it's really, really helpful to just proactively take authority over those things and cleanse our home and uh, remove anything that, you know, has any kind of demonic, um, that may be an inroad for the demonic there. Okay, give me some feedback. Was this helpful to you? Um, if you have follow-up questions, go ahead and type those in. And um, I have one last question I want to address today. Our time is almost up, but I promised one of my students that I would talk about this. So I'm going to move on and talk for a few minutes. This is a question that came in. He said, considering you have been newly transferred to a local church in a community where there's no relationship between the people and the church, 
what can you do to bridge the gap between the people and the church? So I appreciate this question. I think basically to reframe the question, what do you do when you have a church that's in a community but is not engaged much with the local community? The people who attend the church maybe come from outside the community, or if they come from the community, there's been no efforts to see community relationship and community impact, community favor built there. So three quick tips before we wrap up today. One is you want to start with prayer. So start by encouraging the members in the church to pray and, and do this in your church service, to pray regularly for the community leaders. Find out who they are. Find out what they are. Now, you may be in a completely different political party than them, or you may not agree with their policies, that's totally you know, irrelevant, really, because the Bible says that we should pray for our leaders, right? And so you can pray for them, not just pray for them to change to your party, right? But pray blessing over their lives, pray for their families, pray that God would guide them and give them wisdom that comes from him, pray that they would, they would flourish in their their lives as people right and that they would um, have understanding how to solve the problems in your community right so encourage first prayer for the community and prayer for the leadership in the community the government that operates there second thing with prayer is pray for, you know start encouraging prayer walking and i would also encourage what we call prayer mapping so uh, get a group of people to do prayer walks and to start to just observe their community to get a you know as we pray we get a heart for our community right so uh, get them out in the community walking and praying and blessing the community and believing that God is going to do something there. This will build faith in their hearts. So I would start with prayer. The second thing is build relationships and serve the community. So look at what are the needs in the community. Does the community need a playground that you could provide as a church? Does the community need um, English teachers, does the community need uh, help for, um, for women in crisis? What could you do? What are the needs in the community? Again, have those discussions and dialogues with some of those community leaders. What are some of the areas of need? Um, maybe there's a need for daycare that your church could help provide or uh, help financially sponsor if you can't um, provide volunteers, but what could you do to find ways to serve and build relationship and encourage participation by the church in community events? Maybe there is already something that the local government is is encouraging to have happen. Maybe it's a neighborhood watch program, or maybe it's something that uh, uh, an initiative that the government is trying to take. Maybe it's a vaccination program. How could volunteers from your church come alongside that government effort, that community effort, and show yourselves to be responsible, um, interested citizens and participants? So, you know, and in order to do this, I'll just speak really frankly, and you may not agree with me 100%, but that's okay. Um, you may have to have less church programs so people have enough time to be involved in community programs. That may have to be an intentional decision that you encourage, that you, you help people to give instead of having so many church activities that they're volunteering for and having to help with, you encourage them for community engagement. And you, in a sense, endorse that as something that you as a church are going to be involved in and you're going to help with. Um, an after school program that you say, we're going to come alongside and we're going to help with that. Uh, maybe there's a school in your area that needs um, volunteers to help at the uh, the lunch program, or they they need volunteers to do tuition for the kids who who can't afford tuition. Their parents can't afford to pay for that for them. Or there's something that you can encourage volunteers to do to serve the community. So more go church and less come church is probably going to be needed there. If you know what I I mean by that. And then the third thing that I would encourage um, in response to this question is 
look for ways to restore relationship or reconcile relationship between the church and the community if there's been any area of frustration or any area of offense, right? Look for ways to restore that relationship. For example, um, my church in Bloomington, Minnesota, we had to really work on helping our church members. Our pastor did, I didn't do this personally, but I watched him do this. Um, because on Sunday morning, people would drive to church fast. They would, um, they would, there was parking issues. There was noise on a Sunday morning when people are trying to relax and sleep in. And um, we had to really talk to people about their behavior on Sunday morning when they're arriving at church affects our community image and how this community perceives us and whether or not we are loving our community. And so we had to change and work on our behavior so that it would be a blessing to the community, not a curse, right? Not something they saw as a curse because these Christians always come in and they, you know, they make all this noise and they cause problems. So look for those areas that may be sort of a rub or a frustration with the community. And how can you reconcile those? How can you go and apologize for those things with uh, community leaders or people who've been offended um, and look for ways to bless rather than and be seen as a blessing rather than as a curse in the community? So those are my three tips. Start with prayer, build relationship and serve, and then restore or reconcile any kind of area of offense. And as you do those things, I know God is going to anoint you to grow that relationship with your local community. As people begin to pray, they're going to get a heart, they're going to get relationship, and they'll have op opportunities for those spiritual conversations, a chance to build uh, more relationship, hopefully invite people into discovery Bible studies or into attending the church. And um, I hope that's a help to you as you think about this issue. Wow, our time went by fast. We're almost 40 minutes here today. But if you have more questions that you would like me to address on how to make and multiply disciples, go ahead and put those in the chat. My assistant will put those into a file for me, and I'll be sure to address those next week or next time I'm on here for a Q&A. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful weekend. Go out and make and multiply disciples. God bless.